All right, welcome everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, so glad you're all here. This is Jewish Voice for Peace, New York City's Conversations with Movement Elders series. Um, and I'm Eliza and I'm so lucky this afternoon to get to engage in a conversation with one of our most courageous and brilliant movement elders, Dr. Rabab Abdul Hadi. For those who are new to Jewish Voice for Peace, we are a national membership organization of Jews working to challenge Israeli state violence against Palestinian people. And we come together out of the conviction that Palestinian people, like all people, deserve justice, dignity, and freedom. And we work to support many different movements fighting white supremacy and state violence from the US to Palestine. So this series, Conversations with Movement Elders, is every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And you can register for it at jvp.org slash movement elders. And the series really came about because in this moment of COVID-19, of mass death, of mass uprising, all of us, and especially younger people like me, have really felt this desire to turn to those who came before us, who've led our movements for decades, to ask, what do you think we should know right now? How have you gotten through challenging times and times of upheaval before? Um, and I feel so grateful to get to attend this series every week, and I hope you'll keep coming back and joining me. And if you want to be part of JVP in other ways and be part of a political community that's taking action in this time, whether that's showing up on the streets to demand a world without police, um, pressuring district attorneys in New York to free all prisoners from the dangerous and inhumane conditions in local jails, or leveraging our voices as Jews to speak out against the further annexation and theft of Palestinian lands, you can email newyork at jewishvoiceforpeace.org and we'll get you plugged in. Before introducing Dr. Abdul Hadi, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the lands that we're calling in from. My friend Jay, who organizes this entire series and is amazing, reminded me the other day that as historic uprisings have toppled monuments to the Confederacy this month, the person whose statue has been most targeted besides Confederate generals has been Christopher Columbus, which really has shown how intimately people are linking the struggle for Black liberation to the struggle against brutal centuries of colonizations. Today, while we're a New York City chapter, over Zoom, we're gathered over many lands, and wherever we are today, there are stories of people whose land has been taken by acts of violence, and still they found ways to resist, from here in this empire to across the ocean in Palestine. And it's truly incredible to be in this moment together where our movements are making the connection and making clear that to defend Black lives is to support Palestinian freedom, and that decolonization everywhere has to be part of our work. So I just wanted to say that. And I think for many of us, both young and old, there are few people who have taught us more about the interconnectedness of struggle and about all fights for freedom being intertwined than Dr. Rabab Abdul Hadi. Rabab, it is truly such an honor to have you with us today. You have just mentored so, so many people in our movement and we owe so much to you. And we know that there are a lot of incredibly important and beautiful things happening on the streets right now. So we really appreciate you taking the time to share your stories with us. Well, I'm very happy to be here. I love JVP. I love JP New York City. I see a lot of uh, people who, with whom I've worked throughout the years. And I also a lot, I see a lot of younger people whom I've met also. I'm also really happy to become uh, officially an OG. And uh, when I said that, Elena cracked up. I actually did not really know. I thought people were calling me. This was in 2008 when we were organizing for the 40th anniversary of the San Francisco State 1968 strike. Uh, that, uh, that was the longest student strike in the history of the US led by the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front. And one of the younger uh, students, Palestinian, said to me, we really need to do a panel with the OGs. And, uh, and I said, and she said, you're OG. I said, what do you mean I'm OG? You cannot, yeah, I'm, I'm not OG. I'm, I thought she was actually calling me old guard. And uh, coming from, you know, background, uh, leftist background, you don't want to be called old guard ever. And then she explained to me what OG meant. And I'm like, yes, I'm very happy to embrace it. But I was always sort of hesitant until I became 65. So now I'm officially an OG and I'm, I'm embracing it. I'm embracing being an elder and so on. Although I don't feel old and I'm sure everybody else who has been already on these conversations uh, whether Laura, Shotzi, Raz, and anyone else you've had already. Um, it's, it's very interesting to kind of like think old and elder. And so 
I just wanted to mention that, but thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, you definitely don't look a day over 30, so. Thank you. <laughs> um, and for those of you who don't already know her, Rabab Abdelhadi is an award-winning Palestinian professor at San Francisco State University who has been a huge leader in the struggle for Palestinian liberation through her scholarship, Pedagogy and Activism. She's the director and senior scholar in the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas program at SFSU, and she recently won a very prestigious award from the American Association of University Professors for her courage, persistence, political foresight, and concern for human rights. And she's also been the subject of a relentless McCarthyist bullying campaign from right-wing forces who seek to intimidate and silence her. In fact, the Zionist Lawfare Project sued her twice in two absolutely ridiculous and frivolous lawsuits, but she won both cases and is still teaching. And now she's actually opened a new chapter in the fight, filing suits in federal and state court and suing SFSU for discrimination, racism, and Islamophobia. And if her case succeeds, it will help other schools protect their faculties and students from harassment and pressure from the Israel lobby. And we'll be talking a bit about that later today. Um, but I just wanted to say that I first met Rabab at a summer Skillshare a few years ago for student organizers in Students for Justice in Palestine, Palestinian Youth Movement, and Jewish Voice for Peace. And Rabab, I know I told you this the other day, but I just really feel like you've taught all of us, and especially young people, so much about this idea that when they come after us, we protect each other and defend each other, and we get up and we fight even harder for what we know to be true. Um, so I just really want to thank you for being here, and I guess to begin, I want to welcome you and ask you to just tell us a bit about yourself. You have been doing this work your whole life. You've been attacked and you've persevered. Who are you? How did you grow up to be this way? And what were the communities that meant so much to you and that now you mean so much to you that really made you who you are? And so I learned at an early age and then also many of my uncles would be disappearing and they'll come back very soon. And then we will ask what has happened and they have been in Jordanian um, military, Jordanian prisons, you know, tortured or whatever had happened to them. All we know that they lost a lot of weight when they come back. And then uh, fast forward, I also grew up and I was 12 years old when the 1967 occupation of the rest of Palestine took place. So I experienced uh, curfews, I experienced uh, people's homes being demolished, I experienced many people getting killed, including um, the neighbor's uh, son who went out to cheer what he thought were uh, Arab armies. It turned out that they were Israeli tanks and they killed him. So I've experienced what occupation was all about. So this, is, this was sort of like the overall coercive environment, but uh, the coercive environment in itself does not really explain why people become active. And I think the other aspect of it is that uh, the around me, the community, my family, the people we knew, uh, my mother's friends who were constantly signing petitions, uh, giving donations, getting en engaged in sit-ins, uh, uh, hunger strikes, and so on, support of prisoners against people whose homes were demolished, and so on. I grew up uh, in that environment, so I really learned at an early age that, like many other Palestinians and many other people in, in coercive environments, that you really have to stand up and you really need to fight for what you believe in. Otherwise, you will never, just because there is an injustice, if you don't fight against injustice, the injustice gets perpetuated. And I guess we're seeing the lessons today. So that was very, very important for in my upbringing. That was one thing. The other thing is that also as I grew up, there were a lot of mentors along the way, a lot of collective structures in which I've been involved. A lot of people who were much older than me, who I would, uh, they were my OGs and other people's OGs who were also teaching us uh, how to organize, how to move forward, how to not give up. So there were a lot of influence on my, on, uh, on my life uh, to the point where I've just really learned that you can't just, you can't give up. You have to continue struggling, you have to continue speaking up, you have to continue standing for what you believe in. And you have to rely on the, let's say, I don't know, thousands and millions of people who are supporting justice in for Palestine, supporting justice for all, uh, supporting what I would, what I like to refer to as the indivisibility of justice being inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. where he talks about an, in, uh, an injustice anywhere is threat to justice everywhere. So to me, this was, these are some of the things that were influenced. Me. It's, it's very weird for me to be talking on the phone, so I'm going to just like pause and let you kind of like 
ask the questions. I can't even see them on my computer screen. This is Eliza Rabob. That's also great. And I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties too. Um, but everyone is just so happy to be here and so excited to hear from you. And thank you for calling in despite the power going out um, where you are. Um, I want to ask you a question about the recent award um, and just your, your humility. Um, I'm so struck by your humility and just by the ridiculous humility of so many of the giants in our movements. And, you know, Angela Davis always talks about how we wouldn't even know who she is were it not for the work of so many other people. And you recently yeah. won this incredibly prestigious American Association of University Professors Award. And in the press release, you're quoted as saying, I see this award as an award for all of us. And I'm actually yeah. going to read a small part of the press release right now. Um, you said, this award does not belong to me alone. It belongs to everyone who sacrificed and who continues to advocate for justice in and for Palestine in particular, and the indivisibility of justice in general. At this historic moment, I dedicate this award to both the victims of racial terror, police and military violence, and structural racism, and to the organizers of the uprisings against white supremacy, settler colonialism, anti-blackness, and police brutality from Minneapolis to Jerusalem, and from Brazil to Kashmir and Puerto Rico. So, you know, you're getting all these really well-deserved honors right now, um, but you've always really been centering that it's not you alone, it's communities, it's collectives that make change, even as you yourself have sacrificed so much and have to give so much time and labor. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think communities nourish and sustain us and how they make individual actions possible? Yes, I mean, it is, it is true. I would have never become the person that I am if I were not uh, conditioned and uh, nurtured and uh, taught how to be a program, as we say in Arabic, and uh, how to fight for it. So, and I think the AAUP award, because the way that they, the, the award I received was not only for what I do. It wasn't because uh, of uh, a, an individualistic accolade. It was really affirmation. I mean, the award itself talks about uh, the the Ahmed Studies Program, Arab and Muslim Ethnicity and Diaspora Studies Program, talks about uh, the uh, just teaching Palestine, talks about uh, the way the organizing, union organizing, talks about gender and sexual justice, talks about all these issues to which I am committed and in and, and which I've been involved. So when AUV comes and says, we're going to give you this award, it's really being given to all the movements to which I belong. And it is really affirmation affirmation of of uh, of why we really need to uh, oppose silencing why we need to oppose mccarthyism why we need to uh, say that zionists do not own jewishness why we have to resist hate speech a threat death threat um, death threats and and uh, threats at maligning smearing and so on why is it that we really need to organize as, as as collectively i mean one of the things that has been really really troublesome in the recent period has been universities who are trying to establish facts on the ground by laying off lecturers, by uh, trying to uh, cut quote unquote corners and so on in order. And, and it's very interesting because San Francisco State, for example, wants to eliminate a lot of jobs for lecturers, but there is a rise in hiring more administrators. So there is an issue with that as our universities become more corporatized and become more privatized and thus become subject to donors I am private interest instead of becoming uh, accountable to the public. So this is also uh, one of the things that I, I, I cite in, in, my, uh, in, in the blog that I wrote is that there are many faculty members, I guess hundreds of faculty members have threatened to boycott universities that are going to lay off uh, lecturers to try to undermine the, the jobs of uh, junior scholars or graduate students and so on, because we really need to insist that education is the right for all. And we should really be insisting that education should be free. I mean, unfortunately, it is not. But un, un, under these conditions, it cannot just become a privilege to those who are able to afford it or students who have to scrape and get loans and uh, uh, borrow and have three or four different jobs, like many of my students at San Francisco State University. And then the, 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 the last uh, um, point that I think uh, that why the award was really, really important, because it really affirmed uh, that uh, the Ahmed Studies Program is a worthy program, that it is validating that we have the right to build the program, we should be building the program, and the program should be 
uh, a way to bring the academy and the university together that we are inspired by the spirit of 68, the students who struck in, uh, in 1968 and demand that the university cannot just be an Ivy League uh, cubicles where people can just hide and only write and for themselves and each other and sometimes in often very jargonistic language that nobody understands but actually the university is obligated is not it's not even a, a privilege and it's not something nice we're doing but the university is obligated we as educators are obligated to learn from uh, community uh, activists to learn from elders to to produce knowledge that indigenous that recognizes and validates the lived experiences of marginalized communities that actually enable students, especially students who come from marginalized communities, from indigenous communities, communities of color, poor communities, communities who are con continuously marginalized, that they, their experiences are as valid as the experiences of what the university historically tries to teach us about, quote unquote, the classics of the Romans and the Greeks and so on, which becomes a very slanted history and as you've mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, conversation, it's really important also to think about what kind of history we are teaching our students and what kind of history we're co-learning with each other. So to me, all of these things together do represent why is it that I think the award is a very collective affirmation. I should also say that the Zionists have launched a very strong campaign, Zionists and, and other right-wingers, for example, campus reform, uh, Christian Zionists or uh, uh, right-wing forces, as well as uh, the Academic Engagement Network, uh, the, um, the Stand With Us, uh, multiple Zionist groups have actually tried to pressure, to smear me, uh, to pressure AAUP, to say that AAUP should, might have to lose its uh, tax-exempt status and that they should rescind and take away the awards from me because they are very disturbed by the fact that AAUP uh, an organization of uh, over 40,000 university professors is reflecting the side that is happening across the United States, wherever we are in university campuses and outside, that things are changing, that people are changing and people are uh, finally, more and more people are finally recognizing justice for Palestine and realizing that you cannot exceptionalize Palestine. You cannot say that justice applies to everybody else except to Palestine. So AAUP is, is, is reflecting I think you're cutting out a little Actually, bit. Actually, um, invited me. A, uh, I'm sorry. AUP invited me to to publish a blog, as they invited the other recipients of the award, my uh, other colleagues, who I'm very proud to be part of. So it's uh, uh, but they keep trying, and that 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 bullying is 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 uh, constant. It's continuous, it's structural, it's institutional, and it's actually quite, quite rough. But uh, is the power back? Okay, I'm, I think I'm going to try. I'm going to keep talking, and then I'm going to try to to see if I can get on the on online as well. Okay, so yeah, let me yeah. So that's why I believe that the, the award is is uh, is collective. I got thrown off a little bit because of this. I don't know what happened with the power. Let me see if I can get. I can look it up. Thank you so much for sharing all that. That was all so, so inspiring. Um, I, while you see if you can get online, and no worries if not, um, it has pulled up like an amazing picture for you to share while you speak. Um, but I want to ask you a question about backlash. Um, mm -hmm. And you touched on this a little bit just now. Um, but you have just faced so much backlash throughout your career. You have been Barraged with Zionist and white supremacist smear campaigns. Right now, you're being harassed by administrators at San Francisco State University who are trying to push you out, cancel your courses, and destroy the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diasporas program you founded. Um, and as much as we at JVP are situated differently, we also experience backlash. And while it may be different, and while the risks are certainly less serious for us, the way that you have so courageously responded to backlash has really emboldened me and taught me so much. And I think many of us have been so inspired watching you. Um, and as a student organizer who was targeted alongside uh, many of my friends by Canary Mission and other right-wing reactionary forces, you really were one of the first people who helped me feel less afraid and made me feel really proud of the work I was doing. And 
I really think you taught me and hundreds, if not thousands of other student organizers a lot about not just preparing for backlash, but taking it. Um, and I just want to know if there's anything else you want to share with us that you've learned about how to persevere in the face of really intense backlash. Well, I, I think uh, first let me um, acknowledge and, and affirm what you are saying is that uh, these attacks are consistent, they are institutionalized, they are structural, they're not uh, a couple of people who are on a grassroots level doing a, what, uh, what you might call a cottage industry. This is it's actually quite uh, serious. And it is in, it's intentional, and the intent is to take us out is to take us out to continue attacking us. I mean, there is multiple levels of it. One is, is uh, this continuous attack in order for, to destroy us as individuals, as part of the group. Secondly, is to smear, because the thing they believe that they can create enough noise pollution that people will believe it. And so every single time you see the link again, for example, you mentioned that I was sued by Lofer. They actually revised the law to three times and they failed. We defeated them massively. They keep saying that they brought a very, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, a very important case and so on. Yes, they did bring a very important case and they mobilized almost a, a firm of almost a thousand lawyers, mega firm to work for them and so on. And we worked with uh, two movement uh, proponent lawyers and a, a very, very big movement and we defeated them. The, 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 but they never talked about uh, being defeated. They just keep saying that they actually sued me in order to do this, but they got defeated. But the cause of that, what happened is that it took 18 months of my life trying to every single day in and day out deal with things that I'm not really qualified, I'm not even equipped, I'm not a lawyer, that I need to read um, legal documents, I need to pay attention to them, we had to go to court multiple times. People in the, in the movement have been amazingly supportive. People mobilized, came to the court several times that the judge at one point actually asked lawfare and their lawyers to sit in the jury box because there was no space for them to sit where they are, where they're supposed they have a whole, there were a whole bunch of them, but because we had people from the whole movement involved, we mobilized, but you can think about what does it mean for the resources of the movement to actually be taken out by that. Then when that all failed, you know, uh, uh, that even before that I was, uh, we had, I was like my other colleagues and my students and other students around the university, we were confronted by the Horowitz posters, the hate, uh, poster, wanted style posters that were put on campuses all over. We had four times they were put on San Francisco State campuses. And the problem is that the university says that it is, they are, they don't take them down because this is, a, this is protected speech. And we say that this is hate speech. This is not freedom of speech that's going on. This is hate speech that will escalate to violence. Uh, because if you can fast forward, I have received uh, my voicemail that has been quite um, saying that Jews will live, Muslims will die. I've received the uh, different letters that I've shared with you before the call. I'm trying to actually get on the online now. Finally, I'm getting the connection. And let me see if I can join. All right, I'm okay. Ah, perfect. I'm actually being able, just give me a minute so I can enter it and see if I can do it. And so, uh, so this is, they try to do all of this stuff. And one of the things, they, they, so when they fail, in uh, trying to um, scare us, when they fail in trying to intimidate us and so on, then they try to actually pressure. And this is, I'm talking about the one. Ah, all right, I'm back. All right, hold on a minute. Let me just lower the phone. Can you hear me? Just give me one minute. Ah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, okay. I'm trying to shut down the phone, but it's not allowing me. Okay, how about this? Are we good? Let me just turn on my video. Can you hear me? Okay, I can see you, but can you hear me? I don't know why I'm not, uh, I can't hear you. We can hear you, Abab. You sound oh, great. Oh, yeah. I can hear you now. All right. Yes. I'm sorry. Where I I I, I just lost my that's my tag. Sorry. <gasps> great. Wonderful. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. 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 We're back. Okay. So I think I was. Uh, yeah. So I think I think part of it is that it's 
it's really, it's not the goal is not only to scare, which is enough in itself really worrisome. And if you think about somebody like me, I've been an activist and organizer for a very long time. Imagine a student who is being trolled on Facebook, who sees as if they are posting things that they're not even posting them. Imagine they are being like our students at San Francisco State. They were put on the Canary Mission. And then uh, two young Palestinian women started hearing, uh, receiving uh, sexual threats of sexual violence against them. And uh, so this is, it, it has multiple effects on your life. And then if that all else fails, it is a question of trying to break down your livelihood. And so it is multiple ways to basically take us out. And I should really emphasize that the reason they are doing all of this stuff, it is a desperate attempt by the pro-Zionist and right-wing groups because they're really failing. They're failing in uh, convincing people, majority, and we know the polls, we see the polls, and this is not polls that we're doing. So they are polls that they've done by Pew, uh, research by all sorts of quote unquote mainstream groups and so on, that are showing that ma majority of people in the United States are leaning to support being sympathetic to Palestine. We see that majority of students and young people are being supported and majority of Jewish young people. And we see that when we go to National Students for Justice in Palestine conferences, when we see all of you and on the, on the, on the, on the front lines. And I think it's really also important to emphasize not only that you are there to support justice in for Palestine, because I do remember, I think it was last year, I guess it was, when a majority of Jewish groups, uh, I, uh, JVP, IJAN, if not now, individuals went to ICE, to ICE uh, headquarters and said never again for anyone. And this was so important because it really talked about the indivisibility of justice. It said, we are not only going to say never again for Jewish people, we're saying never again for anyone. And this is kind of emphasizing what humanity means, what justice means. And it's a huge defeat for the Zionist groups that are, first of all, they continue saying that they speak for everybody and we know they don't own Jewish. I mean, we know that they failed. They tried, okay, many, they tried historically before, even before the Zionist project started. And I always say that Zionism is a passing phenomena. And I think people sort of like say, why? It is a passing phenomena. Look, they're, 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 they're trying to figure out how you confront anti-Semitism has been around so much longer than Zionism, which was one recipe to deal with anti-Semitism. It wasn't the only one, it was one recipe. There have been many voices before and they continue to be many voices after because we do have to confront anti-Semitism in the same strength that we confront white supremacy, in the same thing that we confront anti-blacks, the same thing we confront Islamophobia. We have to confront all forms of racism and racial discrimination, as well as all forms of structural inequalities that we need, and in, including exploitation, including uh, homophobia, including sexism, including uh, poverty. We have, to, we have to fight, we have to fight on all fronts until we repair the world and we actually produce a different world. So it's really, really important to do that. And the Zionists have tried again and again to malign people who are engaged in, by calling us anti-Semitic. And this is, this is not acceptable. I mean, they can, they, can, they can say whatever they want. Of course, nobody can stop them and, they, and nobody can stop them uh, because we also, we do respect people's right to free speech, even if it's hateful speech, but uh, not racist, not called for to violence, but also, because they have the resources, they have the power, they have connections with the, with the, with the government, with the, with the institutional power. However, I think there is a lot of stuff that's changing. And I think this is, and so what happens is that the more achievements we make, the more inroads we make, the nastier they get. So for example, if you remember about two, three years ago, there were all these discussions in the New York Times and elsewhere, does BDS really matter? Everybody and their cousin were weighing in on it. And I, you know, I keep all of these things. So I, like, I like to discuss them and I like to assign them in my classes. And my students say sometimes, why are you assigning such right-wing stuff? And I said, because I think it makes us much more energetic. It gets us lazy when we see things that we believe in. But when we see something we disagree with, the mind goes in overdrive. And it's actually, we try to figure out how we're going to argue against it. What kind of arguments we need. And, and to me, I think framing things and how we shift the discourse and so on is it's really, really important. This was part of the NSJP 
you know, the whole question of the 2018, 2019. But to get back to that, so they really, like, so there was this whole discussion in the New York Times. Why? BDS doesn't really matter. And then the nation weighed in. There was all this discussion and so on. If BDS, BDS doesn't really matter, why is it that they are working so hard to pass laws in 26 states in going to Congress and passing all of Why are they trying so hard? If it is insignificant and it's irrelevant, it doesn't mean anything. Why are they working so hard on it? If we are, we are nobodies, okay? They kind of like say, oh, you know, Rawab Abdul Hadi is controversial. Okay, so if I'm controversial, and I actually don't believe in that, because I think when we challenge the status quo, it doesn't make us controversial. It just makes us for justice. And it just it makes us, allows us to speak up our mind. So if this is the case, why are they trying to kind of like day in and day out to crush me? Why are they trying to do that? If the students are not being ineffective and they're just a bunch of kids running around and doing anything, why is it that they're putting so many resources where it is the Canary Mission, where it is now they're raging complaints to the Department of Education, where they're, they're going day in and day out. And by the way, straight out lies. And I could talk about the UCLA case if we need to, but I think people can read about it and so on. Why are they working so hard? Because they're failing. This is really the problem. I mean, they're failing. It's not only because what we are fighting for is just, and we are, and it is. It's also because they are unable to accomplish results. They are unable to cover up for Israel's colonialism, racism, and apartheid. They are unable to hide with all their power, with all their resources. They cannot do it. They're failing to do that. So what happens? It's just like a bully. Bullies get bullier. They get nastier. They try to attack us again and again. They lash out. And of course, it's dangerous. And we do, we need to kind of like when you talk about the whole community, we need to have love for the community. We need to come together. We need to protect our own. We need to worry. I worry. I always worry about uh, my colleagues who are junior scholars. I worry about graduate students. I worry about my own students who could get intimidated. You know, I don't get intimidated. I don't get intimidated. I don't get intimidated easy. Part of it is because I've also had a lot of experience and I've also have, I have a huge community. I have all of you and everybody around who's very supportive. So I'm not really fighting the battle alone, but I have a lot of experience and it's really rough. It's very hard. Imagine a young student who is wondering in the classroom whether they say something and they are they able to say it. You sit and you try to figure out the question about maybe five or six times by that time the topic has moved on to another topic and we know how these things happen because you have to you have to have the training to be able to speak up to be articulate and so on and speak truth to power it's very easy to speak among friends but it's much well sometimes even to family but it's much harder to be able to speak truth to power imagine people trying to say it and then they say something and whether it is the teacher or it is another classmate or something that there is like a wall of coercion that gets formed, that they feel that they cannot speak. And then you have all this power of the, all these groups who are quite powerful, who are quite well-versed, who have a huge machine, the, 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 the Hasbara machine, the propaganda and so on, that's trying to churn up things about them again and again. And I don't really need to tell you because I know there is a lot of people in J JVP, for example, young Jewish uh, people who are also struggling around their families, trying to change them. I, we, we always struggle with their, our families. So I can, you know, if we had time, I could also. We all do. We all, I've always used to defy my parents and say this is what I want to do and so on. So, but, but imagine people trying to do that and how difficult it is. And then you come to a position of power in the university, in your own classrooms, in your own department, in wherever you're saying, and you say something, and not only is somebody is going to frown upon it and you don't know what's going to happen to your grade if you speak or not, but that the university administration is passing rules day in and day out that criminalize your ability to speak. And I know that from my students at San Francisco State, that San Francisco State has passed a rule that sound over 70, human sound over 75 decibels is not allowed. Imagine, I mean, people because because students went and protested uh, when uh, Nir Barakat was brought to campus by uh, Jewish Community Relations Council and uh, Hillel. He was in town for the APAC fundraiser. And students went and protested and so on. And they only used the bullhorn. So they were actually punished. Palestinian students were punished 
not all students, which is very interesting. Even though the protest was all students, they only singled out Palestinian students, which is in itself racist. But after that, they passed a rule that voice over 75 decibel is not allowed. Human voices. So students can actually gather and chant by themselves, not even using loudspeakers on, or amplified sound. I mean, so you see, and, and this is, I think it's really, really important because the powers that be will find all sorts of ways in order for them to curb activism, to undermine it, to make it sound as if it's business as usual, to make us seem as if we are the crazy ones and we are the angry. And I have to tell you, I mean, whether it is within, you mentioned San Francisco State, some of the stuff that I have experienced is my own dean actually calling me combative and uncivil. I mean, this is kind of like using tropes from Islamophobia, from Orientalism, racist tropes, anti-women, uh, saying that uh, I have to even, every single time I need to send an email, I have to think long and hard before I say anything because I get constructed as angry because, of course, we are not allowed to have emotions. We're not supposed, we're not allowed to have emotions. We're not allowed to have anger. We're supposed to take it all out and say, thank you very much. Please abuse me some more. And so uh, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so you see all these uh, forces that come up again and again and again, and more and more regulations that are getting passed to make it as if it's your regulations, that it's just business as usual. There is nothing is, uh, is going on. They're just, and, and we've, we're, we're, we're continuing to experience that. Actually, we thought when we win the lawsuit against lawfare and we defend the university from this mere allegations, the university is going to say to us, thank you very much. This is wonderful, bravo. Okay, now we're going to stop trying to block you from building the Ahmed Studies program, which I was brought. They recruited me to build it. And we are going to stop criminalizing student activism and so on. Actually, what happened is that lawfare went through the window what they could not accomplish through the door and the settlement with the university. But on top of it also, the university is passing things day in and day out to make it sound as if it is business as usual, including, for example, recently, most recently, they canceled two Palestine-specific courses, the Palestinian Mural and the Art of Resistance, and a course called Comparative Border Studies, Palestine and Mexico, after the excuse that they're hiding courses in order for them uh, because of budget issues are, are around COVID. So uh, this is, it's very, very interesting. So we said, okay, so if this is the case, how come you didn't even, you, first of all, they advanced the deadline for when uh, enrollment is going to be. So for example, the deadlines, the benchmark moves all the time. It's just like the Israeli occupation and the checkpoints that move whenever Israeli soldiers would like to, they set it up, the poll moves anytime they want it because they have the power, number one. Secondly, uh, we, were, we were going to apply for something called a CSU course match, which means that we apply to California State University, all 23 campuses, which is the biggest public system in the country. And so students can actually see the courses and they may want to take a course about the Palestinian mural that is put on public university, Palestinian honoring Edward Said at San Francisco State and think about that and learn about it. Or they may want to think about comparative border studies, Palestine and Mexico. But then they actually deprive us. They, they cut off, they cancel the courses, or quote unquote hit them, before we even had a chance to apply for the course match. They, we, did, we weren't even allowed to enter the liberal marketplace, if you will, to compete, to even offer the courses and be able to apply for them. And it's very interesting because historically, the university, the administrators have had a problem with the Palestinian course, the Palestinian universities. They always said, well, from the beginning, ever, ever, ever since we proposed it in 2016, why are you calling it Palestinian? Why don't you just call it a mural course? And we said, we cannot call it a mural course. This is about A, the Palestinian course. It's very specific. Two, this is exactly why students struck in 1968 to actually validate the lived experiences of communities. Three, it is not really right for us in Ahmed studies to be teaching about the Malcolm X mural or the Cesar Chavez mural or the Indian mural or the indigenous mural. That belongs in the other departments in Africana, American Indian studies, uh, Rasa, which is now Latinx studies, Asian American studies. We should not, it is, it's not our place. It's not our place to actually be teaching about that because there are people capable 
faculty and, and that's why there did these departments were set up in the first place that's why we even have the college of ethnic studies in the first place so uh, we said no we don't want to change the name we want to keep it the palestinian mural and the art of resistance we applied for uh, general education uh, status for all the courses are and we got that but every single time the courses uh, is offered they come up with one reason or another the other reason why i'm really interested in having this course is because the instructor is Dr. Susan Green. Dr. Susan Green is one of the co-muralists. She co-painted the mural with the Palestinian muralist Faya Ka'awaiz. Susan Green, for people who do not know, some people may know who she is, but she's a very long time muralist. She has a project, a project called Art Courses. You can check it online. And she, I know her from the 1980s because she was part of four Jewish lesbians, artists who used to go to Palestine and paint murals with Palestine. It's called Break the Silence Mural Project. I still even have one of the t-shirts. And I think uh, Shatsi and people from uh, the 80s who were involved in Palestine Solidarity Committee would know because what they used to do, they used to go and paint murals inside uh, the art centers in Palestine because you could not paint murals outside. It was, that was punishable by the Israeli military. So if you go to the uh, Palestinian Popular Art Center in El Bire, or you go to the Haitian refugee camp at that center, you go to multiple places, you'll see all the murals painted on the walls. Nothing is painted outside because it was, Israel will shoot you if you do that, right? I mean, I think maybe Shatsi is like smiling because I think you may have seen some of the, so Susan Green was one of the Toko muralists who painted the Palestinian mural honoring Edward Said at San Francisco State University. She continues to be very active. So we thought this actually would be really good. And sometimes when people say, why are you having a white Jewish woman teach it? And I said, this is part of our community. This is part of our communities. And I think students, a lot of the times, actually come to my classes and I'll give them an article about uh, JVP or about Ella Shohad or about Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews or the, uh, the, the Sephardic experience. And they say, we didn't really know. We had no idea. We did not know about this. And it is also, it's part of, advancing justice-centered knowledge production. The other course is called comparative. So they, they keep trying, and even this semester, in the spring, the administrator asked me, would you change the name of the mural and just make it general? So more students will be recruited. I said, no, I think we need to keep this because also part of the education is not only teaching the status quo, but actually challenging us to learn new things, to push knowledge forward. So even if students are not aware of it, by introducing the name of the course, they will become more aware of it. And we have a discussion. You would be surprised how many students at San Francisco State, for example, do not know that we have a Garden of Remembrance that honors the concentration camps which Japanese were held in during the Second World War. They, students don't really know because unless you make a deliberate effort to bring this information, the same discussion that we're hearing now around the statues, around the, the Museum of Natural History and Roosevelt, which people have been organizing, you know, decolonize this space, artists and so on have been organizing day in and day out. It was all forgotten, right? Now they're saying, oh, we think the statue is actually quite racist. And we say, good morning. Wake up and, and smell the coffee. We're really happy that you are doing it. Now to, now to do more, now time to do more. But historically, unless you actually, unless there is an active movement, unless the deliberate action to do that. And this is what happened with the Palestinian mural. So the course was canceled in spring 2019. Now it's been hidden for fall 2019. And if you will just humor me, I want to just share what happened with the Comparative Border Studies course. So the Comparative Border Studies course, we actually started organizing it in 2007. And it was some of my students who were actually studying with me, they were thinking that this would be really great. And it was part of the stuff that I took with me from NYU when I was a uh, postdoc and I was teaching courses. I'm taking students around to different barrios. Like we went to El Barrio, we went to the Museum of the Chinese in the Americas, we went to Harlem. I mean, this is what I come, every week we will go somewhere so students get exposed to different things and hear activists. And so, uh, so when we went to San Francisco, we, we started to do, to do this course. Then it took a while for us to get it approved and then we got it approved and we got all the GE qualification and so on when we passed the minor. So then in uh, the escalation, the attacks escalated. So in 2018, I was going to offer the course and you, this is 2018, we're still in the lawfare lawsuit. Still the lawsuit is going on. 
So I received an um, email from Campus Reform of all places asking me about the course. So I didn't respond because they always sensationalizing and writing all sorts of nasty things. You can even see the recent article about the AAUP award. So I ignored them. So then they sent several inquiries and we did not respond. So then what they did is they went and, and uh, submitted public record requests from San Francisco State University, from the College of Ethnic Studies, from me to request. It's very interesting. So all of a sudden, I start receiving emails from the administrators asking about the course and is there going to be enough enrollment and so on. So this has been going on. So now we want to offer the course in the fall and the course is also one of the courses that is being hidden. So the end result of all of this is that we don't have a single course. If they succeed in this, we won't have a single course in the fall that has Palestine in its title. And this has not happened for a very long time since even I started teaching my Palestine course in 2009. That was right after the Israeli war on Gaza 2008-2009. So part of it is I am sure, I am sure, I am sure, like, you know, not 100% sure, but I'm, let's say 95% sure that this is as a result of the pressure from Zionist groups at the university. Part of it is because the university has become more corporatized and it's actually trying to undermine how many radical things we teach at the university. Part of it is an attack against me because I speak up. Part of it is undermining lecturers because the two courses would have been taught by lecturers under the guise of saving money due to COVID-19. So when I say they are trying to create facts on the ground, I'm not really using just a slogan to draw on what Israel is doing in Palestinian lands. I am actually saying something that, that is really real. This is what's going on. And it's really very dangerous. And uh, the, thankfully, the union has already reorganized a very strong petition over 1,000 faculty members, current faculty, saying we're not going to accept uh, the letting go of, uh, of uh, lectures. California Scholars for Academic Freedom sent a very strong three letters already to the university president saying that we're not going to accept that. And we're going to continue fighting because we believe that these are courses that students are interested in. We believe that uh, we, it's our responsibility to teach. It's our responsibility to produce knowledge for justice. And of course, the recent thing is I heard last week is they're threatening my own courses. So now my, they're trying to cancel my own courses. So this is a new battle that of course I don't have time for and I have enough to deal with, but I'm going to fight it because I'm not going to just accept it. And the problem is that they actually engage in so, all sorts of irregularities. So for example, they'll cap my course at 49, but other courses are capped at 15 students. There is no, no explanation. Why is it 100 level courses capped at that? It is not, it's all of it using the bureaucracy in order to actually undermine any possibilities of activism, any possibilities of teaching around Islamophobia, anti-Arab racism, uh, hostility to Palestine. And it is very clear that, of course, the donors and the allies and the powers that they are in contact with are telling them that this is something unacceptable. They're not taking any prisoners. And it's very clear in the attack against AAUP and so on. But for me, I'm, not, I'm going to continue. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue fighting because I really believe Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, wrote one time that there is something in this land worth living. And I think there is something in this program worth fighting for. And we really need to do that. But we can do it also with the support of everybody, you know, like you. Uh, I, I should give a shout out also to JVP in the Bay Area who are amazing, who have been like with us every single step of the way. And they hold the university accountable as well as our multiple communities of justice. But this is sort of like a, like a little taste of what we are, you know, dealing with right now. Well, that is all so inspiring to hear about. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing all those stories with us and we just have much to learn from you. Um, so thank you. Um, I think I wanna switch gears a little bit and ask you about the moment that we find ourselves in right now. Um, sure. And I'm curious, as someone who's been in this work for so long, what does this moment of uprising feel like to you and why are you calling this moment in the US and into Fatah? Yes. Uh, okay, so let me first say the immediate reason I called it an intifada is because the night before I was watching uh, the news 
and I was watching what's going on, and I uh, and I started hearing one official after another talking about, oh, please do not engage in violence. Do not. And by the way, nobody was engaging in violence. Not that I don't. I mean, this is another thing we can talk about theorizing violence and discuss Franz Fanon and discuss the right of uh, people to self determination and to self defense, which is upheld by the United Nations. But I'm not even talking about that. I was so disturbed that there was, they were talking, started to talk, they started to deflect the conversation from what was going on at the time to question about looting. So it really, really, I mean, it bothered me so much. So I immediately tweeted that I, in a long, uh, what is it, uh, long live the popular uprising from Minneapolis to Palestine, to Kashmir, to Brazil. And, you know, I just put it out there. And, uh, but also, uh, so I think, I think it was really, really important. And then I think I would like, a shout out to my colleague, my comrade, my brother, Robin Kelly, who put a very, very nice op-ed last week in the New York, like two days ago, I think in the New York Times, about the whole question of what does looting and who's doing the looting, but also Center for Constitutional Rights also posted about the, 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 over, uh, the overpay that uh, New York City police are getting paid and so on. And they say, oh, let's have a conversation about looting now. So I thought this was, this was immediately why I said that. But I really do believe that it is an intifada in the sense that I am not trying to appropriate the struggle that's going on here for black liberation to uh, in Palestine or actually make it. Some, but I thought it, it, does, it does have the makings of what I would think an intifada is. And I'm not talking about first, second, third or whatever and so on. I've talked about that many times. But it does, it, a, first of all, something, an act, something happens. And all of a sudden, people rise up. It's usually an, act, an, an event, an event that makes people protest and so on. And then there are, sometimes it becomes an intifada because it becomes sustained. It's sustained uprising. It doesn't happen one day and then stop, phase out. And we know that, for example, there have been multiple wishes on the part of many Palestinians, including me, for a third, quote unquote, third Palestinian intifada. And I made a mistake to put it on my academia.edu one time because I thought there would be an intifada, even though I don't believe in first, second, and third. And then, of course, the Zionists started attacking me left and right. So, of course, now I can't even take it out and I can't even change it. I have to keep it because if I take it down, they'll think that they succeeded. So it's there, even though it doesn't really reflect. But to go back, an intifada is, is, is an, an event that happens, but then it builds. There are forces that build and capture it and basically make it sustained. So we're seeing a lot of actually impact by a movement for black lives, by multiple organizations around, led by uh, black leaders and black activists. And I'm not talking about all the black leaders, I'm not talking about all the black leaders, I'm not talking about the, 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 the people in the Trump cabinet or the only black person who sits behind Trump when he, gets on, he makes rallies or whatever. I'm talking about people who are genuinely organizing. So we're seeing, we're seeing that we're also seeing changes that are becoming long lasting. So for example, with the Intifada, let's say in the 1987 Palestinian Intifada, let me just say a couple of things that have happened just to, say, to symbolically. One is that International Women's Day became a paid holiday and so did May Day. So International Women's Day, at one point, the Palestinian Authority tried to take back International Women's Day and all the women's movement and all the forces in Palestine and so on were up in arms, they had to take it back, they stopped. You know, they, they retreated. But May Day is also a paid holiday, and these were not before the Intifada happened, they were not. So they became institutional changes that recognized women and recognized workers. And so today, what is happening with actually attempts to defund the police, to abolish the police in certain places, to take down the statues, to actually, this is, these are, and to, and to uh, ban confederacy symbols and so on, these become institutional impact reflections of what the movement is doing. So I think, and I'm, you know, and I'm not saying that we are, we're, we, we got to the liberation, we're very far from it, but I do see the makings of what we might say an intifada. And the reason also I use intifada because I was also speaking to as part of my publics, you know, the Palestinians, the Arabs who will recognize when we say intifada, people will know what we're talking about and we recognize that what's going on in the United States is really, it's, it's a mass movement. Do not 
pay attention to all this garbage and the noise pollution, the smearing that's going on. This is really a movement that's going on now. I think we do need to do a lot of analysis. Having said that, now the scholar in me speaks and says we need to go back and do all the analysis and do comparative and so on. And of course, I'm not saying the two contexts are the same. Of course, I never say that, I never conflate them. But I think we do need to kind of talk about them, talk about social movement dynamics and so on. But I do think that there is a making of it, okay? If I'm mistaken, okay, fine. I will, I will, I will accept that I'm wrong and I will accept the criticism to move on. But I think, I do think that it is not, it's not a passing phenomenon. It's not just protests that are happening, that are going on. I think that is something, and it actually also has the leadership from uh, that right leadership, led by, by, by activists in the black community who are really real about it and serious about it and so on. Of course, you're gonna see a lot of the corporations who are trying to you know, appear that they are politically correct and so on. Uh, fine, I think we should hold them accountable to that. So they can, if they want to just try to do it for marketing purposes, we need to hold them accountable to it and say, where are the structural changes that are going on, including the institutions such as the universe. So I think there are things that are happening. We are in a moment that things are changing. And I, I think it's very, very encouraging. And I think it uh, gives me the feeling when the Intifada in 1987, because I, was, I, was, I wasn't aware, I wasn't alive in 1936, so I don't know anything about it. My grandmother used to talk about it, not even my parents. But now that I lived it, I lived, I lived it almost every day. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of things that I recognize, though the contexts are not exactly the same. But I think it is definitely a movement that is being built, that's being consolidated, that's also under danger as well. So we need to also be pay attention to that. Absolutely. Um... And in addition to the uprisings unfolding in the U.S. right now, we also know that Israel is threatening to annex even more Palestinian land as early as today. Um, and you've been fighting for Palestinian liberation for decades. And I think it's really important for us as young people to recognize that this moment of annexation is new, but it also isn't. Um, so I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about how you've been struggling against the conditions that made annexation possible your whole life and how is what we're seeing today in Palestine something new versus something that's been going on for a long, long time. Well, I think I'm um, think first of all to think about the, it is it is it is um, consolidation of uh, the settler colonial project in Palestine. And uh, as somebody yesterday said on uh, on the on the on the webinar we had that was organized by U.S. Academic Campaign for Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, that uh, the annexation began in 1948 and actually a little bit before, and it continues. So I think we need to recognize that there is continuity, but we do also need to recognize that there is a qualitative difference today. That actually for Israel to uh, extend its colonial rule over ma majority of the lands of the West Bank, it's, it is something that is actually a sort of telling international law and the international community we don't care. They are encouraged by the United States government, by the Trump administration. And that is not something that should be allowed. That I think we really, just because we see it as a continuity of the project does not mean that we actually accept it and say, oh, it's okay, it's going to be upper third, it's going to be one set, then we get the one set what we want and so on. I don't think this is not the one set that people are fighting for, okay? This is not. This is a, an extension of colonial rule that we need to fight and we need to stop the, the appropriation of every single piece of land that Israel is trying to take over. I think also the whole question of kind of trying the, Israel, what the discourse around it is Israel trying to legitimize these colonies by calling them neighborhoods and calling them communities. And you see that, by the way, in the New York Times, not only in, in, in the most right wing uh, elements. I think it's actually quite problematic and they're trying to make them as if they are like middle of the center. And then, and then when, when somebody like the New York Times writes about it, of course, they're taking a very Israeli, Israeli centric uh, perspective, and it's not the, the Israeli leftists who are our allies and our friends, of course. This is the most right-wing, the most zealot, the most racist. This is the same people who passed the nation state law. These are the same people who continue demolishing Palestinian uh, homes inside Israel who are Israeli citizens. This is the same government that is uh, uh, depriving people in Nokob from their rights and so on. So this is kind of like part of the whole. So I think it's really important for us to understand what is the extent, the geography, the involvement of 
the extent of the settler colonial project and that it is always a project that needs to expand. If you think in the history of the United States, and again, I'm just citing this as sort of a reminder, not in order to say the context is the same. Think about quote unquote the West, think about manifest destiny, think about the continuous um, quote unquote uh, frontier, you know, all these terminology that gets used and so on. Uh, I think it's very, very dangerous. I think that it is something that people really need to, we should not allow it to pass, but I think it is something that we, we also um, shows the extent of the strength of internationally, even, even the most sort of like quote unquote conservative governments are standing against it. The only support Israel is having is from the US, Bolsonaro, and even Moody sometimes supports, sometimes doesn't. I mean, this is kind of like, it just reminds me of the 80s when there used to be votes again around uh, the apartheid South Africa, Namibia, and so on, it will always be the US, Israel, and sometimes one other country, will, and South Africa will be voting for them, with them in the US. So I think on an international level, that is very clear. In terms of what's going on in the Arab world, no, I'm not, and there is on the level of governments, there is kind of like concern, not sufficient as usual, but on the level of the people, there is a lot of concern. And internationally, there's a lot of concern. And that I think most importantly, it's exactly like we talk about the black liberation struggle, is that the Palestinians are struggling. They're struggling day in, struggling day out, and they're refusing to give up. They're staying on their land. They're saying, we're not going to be moved. We're not going to, we're not going to leave our land. We're going to stay here, no matter what. I think it's a question of, and this is kind of like what I spent my life doing, and I will continue doing. It's a question, how soon can we end the suffering? Depends how stronger a movement we can build. I think this is, the, this is the question, is the stronger the movement we can build, the stronger effort we can do to basically defeat the forces of colonialism, of oppression, of, of, uh, of Islamophobia, of racism, of white supremacy and so on, the sooner we will be able to minimize the suffering the way in the same breath that we are saying that in, in, in terms of uh, we don't want to have more people getting killed by the police. We don't, we don't really need more examples. We've got enough. There is at least 400 years of history of the United States and over 500 years of the Stellar colonial project that actually shows us what's going on. We just need to move. Sometimes things happen in order to expedite. that. We have martyrs whose lives are sacrificed and lead to movement building. I would not want anybody to be martyred. I would not anybody to be sacrificed. Since they've already started doing it, so we're going to build a movement in order for us to learn and make say never again. The same way that you all said never again for anyone when you went and protested around um, at, at, uh, at ICE. And uh, people also, the word said never again after the Holocaust. Never again, never again for anybody, for any massacres, for any genocide against any people. We need to build another world, and we only can do it if we all come together. And just because there is an injustice, as I said, it's not enough. We need to organize in order for us to actually stop that, to push back against it, because they're not going to relinquish. They're not going to give up. They're not going to go and hand us and say, here, we're going to give you power. They're not going to do it unless we take it. And in order for us to take it, we need to organize again. Absolutely. Um, and something that I think I'll be sitting with for a while that you just said um, is the quote, how soon we end the suffering depends on how strong a movement we can build. I think that's so beautiful and want to embroider it on a pillow. Um, and I guess as a final question, before we turn it over to q and I just want to ask you briefly about your dreams for the future. You know, we're in a moment that is just full of so much possibility and you've invested so much time in younger generations as an educator and professor. Um, and in difficult times, you've really helped many of us find hope. Um, and I'm just curious, what are some of your dreams for your students and the world that we're gonna grow up to make together? I would really like for all the younger people not to have to experience the horrible world that we've experienced. And that is something I will fight for and I will continue to fight for. Uh, so I think, I, 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 I do believe another world is possible. I do not believe that you grow up and then you abandon your beliefs and so on because it was only a passing stage in your life that you're allowed to do that while you're in college, while you're young and so on. So I don't really agree with the Todd Gitlins of the world. 
and I was uh, I was very happy to kind of like if people haven't checked it out, there was a book that was written by Chesa Boudin and Ismail Khalidi and a bunch of young people that said a letter from a from young activists in response to Tad Gitlin telling them you're gonna grow up and and stop. It's kind of like the message from somebody who was involved in SDS in the 60s to tell people give up. I mean. Like, why did you even, you're defeating what you stood for, what you said you stood, you stood for. So for me, I really believe that we need, we need to continue struggling. I really would like us to be able to have, to continue to have a movement. And I think people who heard me say it before, definitely, definitely, I think probably Shahzi and Raz and Gail and uh, Sherry and other people, other comments we've been organizing day in and day out. I always, I love Emma Goldman saying, if I can't dance in the revolution, I don't want to have a part of it. And so I want to reverse it. And I want to say, I want to, I want to be part of a revolution where I dance. So I think smiling, loving each other, listening to music, cooking a nice meal, making, uh, growing some, some, some herbs and so on. For me, these are the things that also make me very happy. It's not only that we are organizing and we're teaching and we're making political speeches and so on. It's also, when we were, when, when I used to be part of the 80s organizing and so on, I used to always, like, we will go and we march and then people will start chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, occupation has got to go. And of course, there are also some people who are really, really serious who say, you know, some of my people in the community and so on. And then I'll see a bunch of people who say, hey, hey, ho, ho, occupation has got to go. And I will always, like, gravitate towards people who are, like, dancing and singing and chanting, and of course. Every single time there was always the rude interruption of the cops trying to kind of like uh, say beat up people. So there we have history actually of people being beaten up. Myself, I, somebody spat at me and I actually have the picture and I told the cops in a protest in 42nd Street in front of the Israeli consulate. He said, I don't care. I didn't see it. I'm like, here's the photo. No, no. Anyway, but I think, and we do get attacked and so on. We need to protect each other and we need to be well organized and so on. At the same time, we also need to enjoy the moments of joy. We need to come together. We need to feed each other. We need to sing with each other. We need to, because it's about love for the community. At the end of the day, why is it that we want to create a different world? Isn't it in order for us not to have to suffer the same thing that we have suffered before? So if that's what we want to accomplish, we should also be enjoying it in the process as much as we can. And I'm not saying when people drop martyrs you kind of just go and dance or when uh, when somebody is in prison and so on you're just like engaging in joking and laughter and so on uh, but i am saying in it we're in it for the long run if we're in it for the long run we need to be able to last in order for us to be able to last we can't just be like a match we can't just turn it on light it up and then finish the next day we can't get burned out we need to be able to take care of each other worry about each other uh, and I have a different take on the self-care, but we can have another discussion about it. What does that mean and so on? Because sometimes I think, I think there is over indulging in that, but that's a different discussion. That's a very, very long theoretical and practical discussion. But I think we really need to, we need to realize that it is going to be a very long protracted struggle and we can't just get burned. And we need, to, we need to make sure that people have roofs over their heads. We need to make sure that babies are getting fed. We need to make sure that if, if any of our comrades need childcare, we're in there to do that. This is one of the things that I remember from our organizing at the Union of Palestinian Women's Associations in North America. We never ever said it is women's responsibility who come to the convention to take care of the children. Never. Because that's their chance to actually have a break. That's their chance to go and stand and argue and debate and do whatever they want to do. And we organize all of this stuff. This also was happening also in, in the Intifada. This is one of the things that the Union, the Higher Council of Women was organizing around. I think these are some of the things that we really, in order for people to struggle, they also need to have the foundation to struggle. They need to have the tools, the mechanism to be steadfast and to struggle. We cannot expect people to struggle without actually giving them the support that they need to do so. So I think we also, this is really an important thing to kind of like be, love each other. I, I am all for criticizing and criticism and so on. I'm not, I don't, I don't just say pat people on the back and say good job all the time. Not every, there isn't always, uh, you know, golden stars all the time and for everybody, okay? I don't believe in that. But I think there is criticism, there is self-criticism, there is constructive criticism. There is ways we used to fight with each other. And after we will go have a meal. 
because we're in it further. We believe in what we're doing. So I think there are different ways that we can actually learn from each other, be much more human towards, much more loving towards each other, to build a community that will last for a long time in order for us to deliver the tomorrow that we want to deliver. Thank you so much. Um, wow, that was all such amazing wisdom and advice. And I actually remember in 2017 at Stony Point, you talked about the same idea and I was like reading through my notes from that retreat when I was preparing for this conversation and something that you said three years ago was like, I want to dance in the revolution before I die. Um, and I think that is just such an amazing, do. amazing note to end on. Um, yeah, yeah. And before we turn it over to questions and answers, I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, I also just want to say that we have raised um, $950 so far on this call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone um, on this call hasn't yet pledged a donation to the campaign to defend Rabab, if you want to pledge right now, you can try to get up to $1,000. Um, and I think, yeah, this um, this legal case is, it's about defending Rabab, who has defended all of us, but it's also about building a really strong movement for Palestine and a strong movement on campus and, um, you know, yeah, fighting, fighting for each other. So if you haven't donated yet, um, please consider if you're able. Um, and now I'm gonna see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, I think we probably have time for one or two. Um, it looks like, Rabab, we have one question about what would you recommend as the next steps for organizing the movement? Okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to recommend because I think there are so many ways. A, first of all, I think we are, I, I trust in all our abilities for us to figure out at one at any particular time what we need to do. I think at this point we have to be very supportive of the black liberation struggle. I think it's really important for us to kind of like step in and step back. Sometimes it's okay for us not to say anything, to kind of just like be supportive. Uh, sometimes we, but we need to put our bodies on the line. We need to be there. We need to do all we can. But I don't know, in every different context, there is different ways. Some campuses, BDS is the best way to do it, to kind of like divest. In other campuses, you need to kind of like uh, confront the curriculum and so on. I think uh, institutionalizing things, if I want to speak about campuses, I think institutionalizing things like the Ahmed Studies Program are really, really important, supporting uh, union organizing, supporting faculty and graduate students, stopping all this neoliberalism and corporatization is really, really important. But what happens in terms of people who are not on campuses? What are they doing? I think people are doing everything that they can. And I think, I think we're in a very good shape as a movement. We shouldn't be happy. We need more, but I think we're, 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 we're doing it. So I, I don't, I hesitate to say, you know, what? I just want to, I, I think we need to kind of like leave it up to the wisdom and the creativity and uh, the genius of people who are every single day surprising us by how amazing they are and how, how much organizing and commitment people are giving and love for each other. Amazing, um, thank you so much. And I think we have one more question um, from Zoe. Um, Zoe said, thank you so much for this inspiring conversation. I've seen on the ground organizers rightfully calling out the US and New York City's complicity in the Israeli occupation yet a lot of young people are still claiming they can be Zionist and also support Black Lives and the movement for anti-racism. What would you say to these folks who try to rationalize this way? I don't think it's okay. I think, uh, I think look, if we believe in the indivisibility of justice, it really means the indivisibility of justice. It doesn't mean except. It doesn't mean we need to be uh, exceptions and so on. We need to challenge people. We need to challenge them where they are. And I also saw actually a, a, a question from somebody who's also asking about what people might lose, like Palestinians who are, work for Israeli businesses, I think, a, I think a, um, if they are supportive of BDS, they need to disengage from the Israeli government, from Israeli institutions, and so on. I also think that this was a question also that was raised during the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and what happened is that Kusato, which was the biggest trade union from South Africa, sent back, wrote a big statement saying, please don't worry about us. Don't worry about our kind of like what we, we're not only study, we're not only working for our livelihood, we're also working for our dignity, for our freedom, and so on. So I think we need to also question what does it mean, the whole structural issue? Why is it that there are businesses already that are connected with the Israeli settler community? 
I think when we actually focus on that, then we can, everything sort of falls in place. So I think we need to struggle with people, we need to challenge them, we need to debate, we need to argue, we need to do what, what, what we are doing day in and day out and challenge people and say, no, no, that's not, that's not okay. Ma, that, that is not, that's not okay. That's something really problematic and that is actually racist and Islamophobic and hostile. And you are, if you are support, if you are and against white supremacy and against anti-blackness and so on, you have to be against all forms of racism and racial discrimination. You can't say it's okay for this, but it's not okay for that. It's not. And divisibility of justice. I think that's the framework that we can actually, I think that, that the framework that would work for everybody. Not, not because it's not about giving, doing favors to people. It's not, it's not saying you should be grateful because we're doing this for you or something. It's actually, this is part of our struggle. We embrace it, we hold it, we say we're part of it. Absolutely. Um, that is all such gold. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And it's almost 5.30, so I think our time um, is up. But to close, I just want to say, Rabab, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and stories with us today and for your leadership and commitment and lifetime of work in this movement. Um, getting to learn from you and be in this movement with you is something I'm so proud of. And I'm so grateful we got to have this conversation um, and just to get to learn from you. Um, and for all of you who are tuned in, I hope that you'll follow up on your pledges um, so that we can strengthen the movement for Palestinian freedom and the movement for Palestine on campuses. Um, and I also hope you'll join us tomorrow at noon at our weekly phone bank to free them all and defund the police. Um, and you can register for that at jvp.org slash free them all. Um, can I just say one? I'm sorry, I, I, you know, can I just ask people to also, uh, also hold San Francisco State accountable. So when you see something, I mean, write your own letters, organize things. Uh, pressure them, tell them that it's okay. They cannot get away with it. They cannot actually shut down our program. They cannot try to harass me and discriminate against me and retaliate day in and day out. They cannot criminalize our student activism. This whole question of Islamophobia, anti-Arab racism, anti-Palestinian hostility, it should not be this business as usual. It's not okay. It's not okay in any institution. It's definitely not okay in a public institution. So I think they also need to hear from you and so on. So we would really want you to also come um, support us also in terms of like raising your voices and letting them know that it is not okay what they are what they are doing and they should actually really support the program that would make any university proud and so uh, and and you know continue the struggle that everybody is doing you're all doing it and I can't wait for us to be able to also see each other in person and be back to some of uh, the JVP meetings where we will have like hard to have conversations and uh, discussions. And yes, I love you all. Thank you so much for always being there, for always having my back. I, I really appreciate you are my community. You're, we will have a different world. We will have a different world also in Palestine. We will be able to do that. Yeah. Maybe sooner rather than later. Rabab, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for taking the time to be with us this afternoon and just for being the unbelievable educator and organizer and mentor you are. And yeah, thank you all for coming. And Rabab, here's to seeing you in person, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Please send me the chat. Don't Absolutely. forget. Because yeah. I haven't had the chance to look at it.